Hey, this is Mikko. In this video I'm gonna show you some of the techniques that I used for painting reflections for glass and water and also go through my techniques of pe painting clouds. I paint clouds quite differently for each picture, it just depends on what the needs of that piece are. In my last painting video quite a few of you asked me about resolution. In this video I want to go through some key aspects of how I decide that resolution because if I just state the resolution for this piece which I'm gonna do on screen, by the way the editor Mikko hates it when the voiceover Mikko says stuff like on screen right now because that's <laughs> all kinds of graphics fork that the editor Mikko has to do later. Who cares? Okay, back to the point. So the resolution is not something that is a specific thing that I always use. I don't always start with a certain template. I always think about DPI, which is dots per inch. That is the print resolution, how sharp the print appears if you send this picture to print. And for that, I never go lower than 300 DPI. You can do higher resolution print material by setting your canvas to 600 dpi, but 300 is usually enough for good quality prints. And that allows you to have higher pixel aspect ratios as well. So for this, the aspect ratio actually matters a lot because this is a wider canvas, so it can't be as tall. I know that this is one of those pieces that is going to have a lot of different elements, so I am making a kind of a ballpark guess on how many layers I'm going to need. And once you go to the settings and fiddle around with the resolution of your canvas, you will see in the top corner how many layers you are allowed to use in Procreate for that resolution. So I keep a close eye on that every time I decide the resolution. The rule that I go by is that just what is the maximum amount of layers. And the maximum amount of layers is something that is kind of like almost to the limit of like what I can get away with. And you will see me struggling with that limit in this painting, but it's something that will force me to do things in a certain order and just clean workflow will help you add more elements and use more layers but if you know where you're going. So for these clouds, I am using the same techniques that I am using in the cloud tutorial that I made in one live stream. I'm gonna put a card here or put it in the links below so you can see that tutorial if you want to learn how to paint clouds like these. Bear in mind that these are clouds that I am using for this style of piece. So this is not the right way to paint clouds, nor is it especially realistic. I just like this very expressionistic, colorful, high contrast clouds sometimes and I think that is the whole point of this piece because I want to contrast this geometric blocky shape of the building with the chaos of the sky and those soft shapes that are kind of harder for the eye to process. So that contrast is something that I'm building on. Also, already at this point, I know that I'm gonna have a very sharp, saturated, bright glow on the top edge of this right angle corner of the building. That is going to be put there last because it's just an extra layer that is not going to give me any other benefit in the painting process. So I'm gonna save that for the last bit to put on this painting because if I slap it on right now, sure, it would give me a better impression of like what the finished piece is going to be, but it would always be taking up that one layer space and those are the precious resources that I really need right now. Because now that you look at these clouds, each one of those is on a separate layer. The dark clouds, the bright blue clouds and this sort of like pink flesh stone clouds, they are on their own separate layers and on those bigger clouds I am adding highlights on a separate clipping mask as well. So that keeps the edges sharp where I want them to be. And for those softer smudgy look, I am using the smudging brush, which I don't re normally recommend using for anything ever. But for this type of clouds, it's the perfect tool. And for that brush, I am using the exact same brush as for uh, painting these clouds and that is the oriental brush which I am a huge fan of and it's not something that you need to buy it's already in your 
Procreate library. It's a difficult brush to learn to use, but I recommend using it because it can be a very versatile tool. And for the rest of this painting, I'm using the same custom brush that I made for myself for every element, the water, the sharper clouds, the rocks, the building details, everything else is painted with that same brush, except the clouds. And for those soft gradients, I am not using a brush at all, because the clouds have so much detail in them, and I wanted them to be this sort of like baroque explosion of contrast. So I didn't want the background sky to compete with that detail, so I used just a Gaussian blur for that. Here I'm adding a few window details as like a suggestion of a balcony for this house and I'm gonna add more detail to this block but when it comes to the composition this block shape is really the main visual impact of this piece so I don't think that the building details are as important to get done first rather than add them on top and when I'm gonna add the building details I am going to make sure that they are sharp but at the same time I don't want them to be too high contrast because they would take away from this main visual impact of this piece. Visual impact is something that I think is very important to be able to communicate when you're working in a team because usually a concept piece is about one thing. If you have freelance clients they will probably ask huge list of things to add to your painting and you will have to be just very calm and collected when you explain that effective pieces, effective artwork is something that has one point of visual impact and you have to ask them what is the one thing that you want to communicate with this illustration. That way you can usually give a much better product for your clients than just taking everything that they are asking for without any conversation and then trying to add them in like you're going through a shopping list because you want them to have the best possible product as well and you have to be able to communicate this sort of like visual problem solving issues because if they are asking for everything and then they get everything they will still be disappointed because you didn't do your job as a basically an expert in this field and did everything in your power to give them a best possible painting and so that's why you also have to understand what it is that your client is going for, what type of story are they trying to tell with that piece, because that's really what matters the most, not how many characters they have in the piece or how many different details they want to have in the piece. Get the emotional message of the piece across in the most powerful way. That will attract their clients that they are trying to communicate with. So that's what really matters and you kind of have to get through this conversation process that way. Now I'm taking a screenshot and pasting it as a screen layer. This screen layer is going to be the reflections of the building and that's why I took the screenshot without the building layer in this piece. I added the screen layer on top of the building and then I set that screen layer as a clipping mask. On that screen layer I went into the curves and I adjusted the curves so that the darker bits are a bit darker because if there is black or dark colors on a screen layer those are less visible and kind of transparent and this is also how kind of these head-on reflections work so everything that is light works. You can see this if you are sitting in a train at night and then you look outside the window you will see only the lights but if there is some light objects outside they will show through the window. I want to have this sort of like matte gradient to this reflection to suggest that there is a little bit of texture to this glass because it's not just a normal window it's part of this entire building so it's likely that there is some soundproofing in that window and that makes that glass texture to be a bit more rough than normal window glass would be. I live by the train track so I have this sort of soundproofing windows and you can see that texture if you look them closely but I just guessing that if it was in a bigger scale it would generate this sort of like more matte look. I don't know if this is factual, I'm <laughs> just guessing. And now I'm adding a second layer of these railings for the area where you can exit this building. And this ramp I accidentally delete at some point and right when I'm finished I will have to add it in again but 
that's just something that happens when you have this many layers. It can get very confusing very fast, especially to the students that are, for example, currently in my concept art class. I always recommend that just do as few layers as possible. If you can paint everything on a single layer, that is just fine, especially if you are new to painting and new to art. Don't make it that much harder for yourself by adding tons of different layers. I mean, this might look fancy, but I don't want anybody to think that if you start painting, you have to have this many layers and all kinds of clipping masks and crazy effects. That is not necessary and it can be very difficult to learn fundamentals if you have all of these technical aspects in your piece at once. I know that the beginning of painting process can be very slow and it might seem like you're painting for years without that much progress in the beginning, but once you get past that initial hurdle, it gets so much more fun and exciting and then using all these sort of like different things doesn't seem that important anymore because you are more excited about the paintings that you can do and what you can express with them and the tools never should be the main focus of, of your piece. That's why I always tell people not to focus too much on brushes because they are just tools and you don't want tools to be taking too much of your time or attention especially. Attention is hard to come by. For these longer paint sessions, I want to highlight this one app that I always use. And this is not a promotion or anything, because I wish that there was like uh, ads on this channel, but there isn't. But I always use this uh, Pomodoro app called Forest. And there are many of these Pomodoro apps. And what it does is that during a paint session, I'm growing a tree for 45 minutes. If I just paint and the 45 minutes is up, that means that the tree won't die. And I have this sort of progression. Because lately when I've had some trouble with my creativity, because honestly this situation has been on my mind and I worried about it like everybody else, just starting is the hardest part. So one trick that I have found that works for me, and this might work for you as well, is to just trick yourself into thinking that what you're starting to do is something easy and it's not a big time commitment. So you might use a Pomodoro app to schedule a work session for just five minutes that I am going to paint for five minutes and then if you really want to stop, you can stop. But usually, once you have tricked yourself into starting by telling yourself that you're doing something very easy, it's much easier to just keep going. Because waiting for motivation never works for me. It's just momentum that brings the motivation. And to get momentum, you have to start. So that should be the priority rather than me waiting for inspiration to come flying through the window, because sometimes it never arrives. By the way, this whole idea for this piece came on a 15 kilometer run on a halfway point and I was like running in the middle of the forest and then I thought that like now the creativity feels like it's a perfect opportunity to come to me with these ideas now where I'm in the middle of the forest and I have no access to my painting tools. So I took out my phone and I screened this voice memo that it's a reflection, there is no building, the whole building is a mirror by the sea. I won't let those ideas go to waste. And I've heard from so many people that when they are in the shower or driving, then the inspiration hits them right when they are not drawing or painting. So I recommend doing some sort of like notepad or memo right at that moment, because it's so easy to forget these moments when inspiration or creativity approaches you with an idea, because it's usually a very quiet voice and it's a real skill to pay attention to it. Here I'm adding lights inside the house. These lights I'm arranging on a perspective grid so that they are kind of like hinting that there is a ceiling inside this house. And I'm adding these to the darkest part of the gradient of the reflection, because this way it's more plausible that we can see through the reflection of the window and see what's inside. And especially since these are lighter objects. I'm also adding this sort of like small suggestion that there are stairs leading up to the higher platform inside this house but I'm only adding them in this sort of like very suggestive silhouette of light hitting those stairs. 
because light would show through the window reflection. At this point you have probably noticed that I am not adding any detail to the border yet, because I am going to use everything that I'm painting above as materials for creating that reflection on that water. I am going to probably keep it close to this range of hue and value, but I'm not adding any details there because it would be just work wasted because I am going to use everything that I'm doing right now as just like building materials for that reflection to come. I am using two types of drawing assist grids for this piece. One is just the normal grid that allows me to make this sort of like easy right angle cuts to the window to add these details that are just straight lines. But for the perspective line, I am going into the drawing assist settings and I'm using also the perspective and I'm using a single point perspective because that's all I need to add the suggestion of this sort of like uh, diagonal lines that you see on the left side of the building at this point leading off into the distance to suggest that there is mass to this building. And if you set a perspective grid that way, you can jump between the two and it will remember where you set that perspective grid so it won't be deleted. One thing that I'm using as a safety net for having all these layers in a single image is just duplicating the entire canvas because that doubles the amount of layers that you can use and you can completely bypass the procreate layer maximum limitation this way. When I'm going into this more difficult adjustments where I flatten all the layers down and I see if some sort of reflection idea works and I know that I'm going to need a lot of layers to do that just to be sure that I have a fallback option, I am making a duplicate. So if I want to go back there, I have a duplication from the time when I have those layers. Or if I want to access the selection of those layers, I can go there and copy the layer and bring it into this new low fat version of that same canvas. And then if I paste a layer from the previous canvas, it will automatically paste into the exact location as long as the resolution is the same. Back to the point that I was saying about resolution in the beginning, that it's always canvas specific, I also change the resolution sometimes. For example, for this piece, I guessed quite correctly what the final resolution is going to be, since I didn't need to change it even once. And that keeps those details super sharp and crisp for the entire painting session. But sometimes I underestimate the amount of layers that I need and then I go into the canvas and I need to lower the resolution. For example, when I'm doing a graphic piece and those are very dependent on having access to those different layers and selections. For that style, I need more layers and I can work with less resolution. But there is an other aspect to this as well. When you're sketching and when you're starting a piece, especially if you're using a brush that has a very restricting maximum size limit, then it's sometimes just easier to block in the main shapes and come up with ideas on a low resolution canvas. You can always blow it up and then continue with the higher resolution version of that canvas. That way you don't have to waste time just like swiping the screen up and down, to, trying to fill in the canvas. If you pay attention to the beginning parts of this piece, I am having some trouble with the maximum size of this brush. And therefore, when I'm adding these different gradients to the sky, I'm actually using the transform tools and the warp tool in particular to just like increase the size of brush strokes that I just made because I don't have time to scratch through the entire screen if I want to see if a one hue of blue works or doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too busy. For these highlights in the rocks, I am trying to be very careful with contrast. It's the same issue that I had with the trees in the previous video. These are not the main point of the piece, but they are just something more organic that will ground the piece into reality and I want to add detail to them but I trying to work with very low contrast range for that to be possible. I am adding lighting effects too and then I am erasing them away on a separate layer mask. This way I can add highlights knowing that what is the maximum cap of those highlights and when I'm erasing them with the layer mask I know that there is going to be more value range. 
Back here, I'm adding a screen layer of the entire detail set, and now I'm erasing it away. But once I saw what is the maximum highlight value, I know that by erasing them, I am not accidentally going overboard with the highlights because I already know what the maximum is going to be. And this is an easy way to solve those issues where you feel like one area doesn't have enough value range, but still you feel like it requires more information to convey the sense of depth. I hate the word depth. It's like the hardest English word for me to pronounce in these voiceovers. This one streak of uh, clouds was bothering me the entire time on the left because it was duplicated. I mean, it seemed like it had a relationship with another horizontal line right above it, and that takes away from the feeling of chaos, and I want to have that certain type of chaos. I mean, it's not ordered, but I need to be aware of this like composition list of rules that I go through in my head. And my students who have ever been on my any of my classes, they know that there is this very theoretical list of composition rules that I go through. And what you don't see in this video is that I sometimes just pause and look at the canvas. And when I do that, I go through that list in my head that I have completely memorized by this point. And it is all those composition rules that I check in my head and to see if I find them in the piece. And that cloud was one of those doesn't check out through my list and then I fix it. But I use it myself. I don't just talk about it. I use it actively all the time. And I know that lists are sometimes very non-sexy way to teach art. But for me, it works so well that I feel like it would be a disservice to the people that I interact with if I didn't talk about it when they want to have advice for painting. Here I'm testing a, a different panels for glass because I think this one massive panel seemed quite unrealistic. I don't think anybody would be able to transport such a huge piece of glass. So now I'm adding just few tiny little highlights to the seams of the glass. This is probably very thick glass. So those highlights are just to suggest that aspect of the glass. And now it's almost time to work on those highlights on the water. I'm adding this rating to the stairs, but I'm not adding any other detail to it because I'm thinking about where that light is hitting that railing inside this house. That light is going to go through the window reflection. So that's the only detail that I'm painting in there. And I want to get as few possible details inside the house as possible in a way that still sells it as a house, because that is not the point of this piece. I think if you're working on a detail that is too small for anybody to notice if they don't go in there and look for it, then you are probably just wasting time. I know that this might seem harsh, but like this is the type of time and energy that people can usually use to work on the more important details that contribute to the visual impact of the piece. If you are working way too zoomed in and don't see the entire piece, like here, the whole piece is like a thumbnail basically on this giant screen. It's really difficult to see what is really important because the details, they might be really fun to do. For example, for me, I love painting these clouds and I love doing the texture on the rocks, but the texture on the rocks is not really going to help that much with the visual impact of this piece. It's more about the way that the mass of the rocks is arranged in the lower half of the painting to make sure that the lower half of the painting also has this chaos of nature the same way that the clouds do and that builds up to the visual impact of that right angle corner, which is basically a box. It's that simple. Now I'm adding some horizontal brush strokes to the water to suggest waves, but this is not the main reflection. Now I'm copying everything in the canvas and then setting it as a screen layer again. And then I'm going into the curves and then I'm taking away all of the dark colors from this highlight. And because curves always boost the saturation of that screen layer as well, I am taking away almost all of the saturation because I already have a blue background that I'm adding them on. So I only need a little bit of hue from the sky to suggest that that is the source of this reflection. 
and it's only going to affect mostly these beams, but just having them there, that helps me a lot with these reflections. And what I'm doing by hand is adding more darker tones near to the bottom of the rocks to make sure that they have kind of like smaller local reflections on the water as well, because the water is quite still. And again, just like with the clouds, there is no right way to paint water and reflections on water. I mean, somebody might come at you with some scientific explanations on how light works. And while that is fine and interesting, those people are wrong and they are also annoying because in a painting, you can paint it any way you want. But if you want to have some sense into it, make sure that that sense is building towards that main visual impact. If it's taking, if that all that logic and science is taking away from the visual impact, it's not useful knowledge <laughs> at all. So you're the creator of your own art piece. So feel free to make whatever you want. I have done reflections in so many paintings in different ways, and I don't think any of them are like the right way. It's just whatever fits for the painting. I think that's, in my opinion, what should be the most important fact. So these reflections are super fun to paint. I know that there isn't like a highlight source for this, but I just think that the bottom half of the painting needs that little bit of like activity to hold up all that empty space. So I'm not gonna apologize for adding this. And when it comes to realism, by the way, I'm adding this glow to these reflections that is completely red. That doesn't make any sense if you think about logic. I just think that it makes the water reflections here. Somehow there's something about it I like. At some point you just have to listen to your intuition and go with it because that is your style. It's not gonna come with these suggestions over and over again. So when you hear that intuition speaking up, you really better pay attention because that's your subconscious talking. and that stuff needs to be heard. And I like these weird colors on the reflections. I think they add kind of like a strange cinematic look to this piece that I just love. By the way, I love looking at this piece. When I was done painting it, I looked at it for almost an hour without doing anything. And I think at that point, the painting is a success to me. I mean, if nobody likes this on the internet, that's fine, because I already got so much enjoyment out of it, and I think that is more motivation for me to paint than somebody else giving me a like on the internet. Here I'm doing the lazy thing again, and I'm using the warp tool to push around large masses of paint to the area of the screen that I want, because it would be too much work with this small brush. I'm adding this sort of like highlight to the top corner of the screen. This again, it's not especially realistic. It's kind of like an anime thing to do, I guess. And now I'm getting to the most satisfying thing. And it, that is this sort of like almost radioactive, highly saturated red glow on the corner of this building. And I always knew that I would add this. And that's why I kept the saturation of the sky in that area so low and made the reflection of the window so dark as well, so that I would have room for this one tiny little speck of full saturation to show. And it's so satisfying to add in at this point, I, I think that it made the whole process completely worth it. I don't know why. I just love that little glow up there. And I tried going fancy with these uh, lamps, but then I decided against it because I think that was distracting because this piece is not about those lamps. So it's fine if they are lower in contrast. And that's the piece. Thank you for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. I'm Mikko. Hit subscribe and like and like do what you want. I'm not your dad. Bye.